Hi, this is Thomas Armstrong. Welcome to week eight of the course, Introduction to Neurodiversity. In this module, we're going to focus on strength-based approaches to intellectual disabilities. The two books that we're using for this course are my two books on neurodiversity. The first one is The Power of Neurodiversity, Unleashing the Advantages of Your Differently Wired Brain, and that's focused mostly on adult neurodiversity, and my book uh, Neurodiversity in the Classroom, Strength-Based Strategies to Help Students with Special Needs Succeed in School and Life. And that book is more applicable to uh, kindergarten through 12th grade education. First, though, I'd like you to think back to your childhood and who were the individuals in your life at that time who in today's world would have been diagnosed with intellectual disabilities? And what kind of feelings did you have toward them? What could you see other people's feelings were or, or their behaviors toward them? And how do you think these people felt about themselves? When we talk of intellectual disabilities, what stands out is the word intellectual, or more particularly, the idea of intelligence. It is, in fact, through IQ scores that many people are diagnosed with intellectual disabilities, along with, of course, their adaptive levels of communication and self-care and so forth. But people with intellectual disabilities are really at the low end of the bell curve, so to speak. Um, they are among the 2% who score at the lowest levels. We remember how in the early days they used to be diagnosed as morons, imbeciles, and idiots. We have better terms for them now, but the bell curve still remains strong. But what if we had a different notion of intelligence? Not an IQ intelligence, but multiple intelligences. Dr. Gardner's theory of multiple intelligences. Gardner suggests that IQ testing focuses mainly on two of the intelligences, logic smart and word smart. And this really opens the door for individuals with so-called intellectual disabilities to be intelligent in other areas. And as we go through some of the strengths of people with intellectual disabilities, we're gonna see that they show up for the most part in these other intelligences that go beyond the IQ score. I'm gonna use the same seven components of positive niche construction to structure this lecture. The first and most important component, of course, is strength awareness. So I'm just gonna go through some of the strengths associated with intellectual disabilities. One is dramatic expression ability. You'll remember the quote that I gave you in an earlier module from John Langdon Down, the physician who gave his name to this syndrome. And he said, children with Down syndrome have considerable power of imitation, even bordering on being mimics. They are humorous and a lively sense of the ridiculous often colors their mimicry. This faculty of imitation may be cultivated and to a very great extent, a practical direction given to the results obtained. It's very interesting that he adds this last part, a practical direction given to this strength or a series of strengths in which I think he's talking about careers. And here's one example of the career of an individual with Down syndrome who, had, who has dramatic abilities. This is Pablo Pineda, a actor in Spain who's won several awards for his acting ability. Another strength is capacity for emotional warmth. In the Elizabeth Dykins article you read for this week, she mentions how the term uh, Prince Charming syndrome 
used to be used with individuals diagnosed with Down syndrome because they had that emotional warmth, that disarming smile, that sense of caring that really marked them out as being different from others, even neurotypical people. And this is something that we don't assign, I think, a big enough value to in the world of education. It's considered, if at best, a soft skill. But I sometimes ask people, who would you rather be on a desert island with? Someone with Down syndrome who has emotional warmth or a jerk with a high IQ score? And this gives us a sense of the relative importance of these traits. Another strength is nurturing capability. This is in particular, in particular associated with prater willi syndrome, one form of intellectual disability. And many individuals with prater willi syndrome make practical use of this caring capability by working in daycare centers, in nursing homes, and uh, in other areas where caring and comfort and sharing and, and, and so forth are important to the job description. Visual spatial skills are associated in particular with individuals with prater willi syndrome. The Dykens article pointed out that people with prater willi syndrome are particularly good at solving puzzles, um, whether visual puzzles or even crossword puzzles. Uh, and they often take puzzle books around with them so that if they have a spare moment, they can spend time doing that. They have a definite proclivity in that direction, as Dr. Gardner might point out. Musical gifts are particularly associated with Williams syndrome. Williams syndrome is a form of intellectual disability that affects one in every 9,000 people. It's the result of a mutation in one gene in the human genome. Individuals with Williams syndrome have often uh, some physical difficulties, cardiac problems, digestive problems. They have unique facial features that have caused them to be called pixie kids because they look like the pixies of fairy tale lore. This is the picture I showed you in an earlier module of the graduating class of the Berkshire Hills Music Academy. This was founded by uh, Howard Lenhoff, or co-founded by him. He's the father of Gloria Lenhoff, who I'll mention in a few moments. Uh, uh, this school consists of many people with Williams syndrome, but also other forms of developmental and intellectual disabilities, and spends half of its time focusing on independent living skills and the other half on developing their musical interests and musical capabilities. Another gift that's associated with Williams syndrome is verbal originality. If you ask someone with Williams syndrome to draw a picture of an elephant as a teen was in this, in this uh, illustration from the reading that we did today, uh, this week in the Scientific American, you can see that it's almost un, I mean, it is hard to make out. You can't see the elephant there. It looks like the work of a three-year-old child. But if you ask him to describe linguistically what an elephant is, he says, what an elephant is, it is one of the animals and what an elephant does, it lives in the jungle. It can also live in the zoo. And what it has, it has long gray ears, fan ears, ears that can blow in the wind. There's, there's a considerable difference between the ability to express verbally an elephant versus the ability to draw an elephant. And in particular in this linguistic example, there's a lyric quality to this linguistic sample that, that is almost musical in nature. What an elephant does and what it has, it has this repetition, fan ears, ears that can blow in the wind. There's a very um, musical sense to this. And as it turns out, individuals with Williams syndrome do like to talk. And they oftentimes use individual unique words. If you ask a person with Williams syndrome to think of three animals, 
Well, first of all, if you ask someone with Down syndrome, they'll probably say something like a pig, a horse, and a dog. If you ask somebody with Williams syndrome, they'll say something like an armadillo, a mongoose, and a um, uh, uh, anteater, or something like that. I mean, they'll really look for the unusual. In the article that you read for this week, which was co-authored by Howard Lenhoff, the co-founder of the Berkshire Hills Music Academy. He has a theory that people with Williams syndrome were the original little people from fairy tale lore in the British Isles. And he argues that the little people are in fact individuals with Williams syndrome who are short in stature, who are musical and linguistic. And he suggested that they were the ones who carried the tales the fairy tales and the other uh, myths and ideas that, from oral transmission uh, carried it from one place uh, in the British Isles to another. And the fact that they had this gregarious ability um, led them not to be afraid of people, but to like to gather them around and tell their stories. So it's an interesting thought. Um, it certainly can't be proven, but it's worth noting. Another strength is determination and resilience. This is often associated with individuals with fetal alcohol syndrome. And finally, a sense of humor seems to be part of many of these individuals, many of these uh, types of intellectual disabilities. Somehow not being hooked up to verbal mind chatter and logical comparison frees up the mind to express itself in laughter. Um, and this laughter is something that, again, is very healing for themselves, for other people that they come into contact with, and for the culture in general. Let's look at some positive role models. For Down syndrome, there's Jason Kingsley, who I actually saw in a in a recent movie. I can't quite remember the, the name of it, but he's also an author. He wrote a book, co-wrote a book called Count Us In, talking about the positive sides of Down syndrome. Then going clockwise, you have Frank Stevens, who testified before Congress, advocating for the needs of people with Down syndrome. Then you have Chris Burke, who was the first actor with Down syndrome to appear in a prime time television series, Life Goes On. And then finally, Sujit Desai, who's a musician who plays several instruments and tours uh, with a musical ensemble around the world. For fetal alcohol syndrome, you have someone uh, like Liz Culp, who wrote the book, The Best I Can Be, Living with Fetal Alcohol Syndrome. For Williams syndrome, you have someone like Gloria Lenhoff, who is the daughter of Howard Lenhoff, who wrote the article and founded the school. And Gloria can sing opera in 26 different languages, including Chinese. And she has the ability to play several instruments and she tours worldwide. So she'd be a great role model for individuals with Williams syndrome. Assistive technologies and universal design for learning tools can include many of the tools that we've already looked at. Uh, tools like text-to-speech apps and software, speech-to-text software, um, organizational apps, uh, writing apps, mind mapping for note-taking, like uh, programs like Inspiration, study skill apps, um, apps to assist in reading, time management apps, and so forth. C communication apps like the ProLoquo to Go um, uh, app that we featured earlier, I think with autism, the augmentive alternative communication device. Some strength-based learning. We talked ab about mimicking and drama being important strengths. So having a child, let's say with Down syndrome, tell a story by putting on a puppet show may be a good way to go in terms of utilizing their strengths to develop their reading comprehension. 
or using school skits to illustrate math problems where each individual represents a number or a symbol and you all get together and do an equation. This would be a good one for older kids with intellectual disabilities. Using pictures would be an important part of developing their capacity to develop um, mathematical skills, for example. And a lot of computer apps provide this highly visual, highly pictorial, highly interactive environment that can really be very helpful to them in developing their academic skills. And using visual instructions, the instructions here for how to act when you're on a bus, a um, life skills uh, objective, and on the bus things that you can do so you don't get into trouble. Um, or so that you can enjoy yourself while you're taking a trip. I also want to mention the idea of flow again. We covered this in module two when we looked at strength-based paradigms. And I want to reiterate that this experience of flow is a um, feeling of absorption, of total commitment, of almost excitement and uh, inspiration when one is fully engaged in an activity, in this case, in a learning activity. And flow tends to happen when the challenge involved is not so great that it will cause anxiety and where the skills involved are not so high or not so low rather that they'll cause boredom. So they need to be challenged with a, an appropriate uh, activity that's kind of just within their capabilities. If it's too easy, they're going to be inattentive and fall off. If it's too difficult, they'll be resistant and also fall off of the activity. So flow, I think, gives us a good map for how to work with any particular instructional strategy. It, it's very similar in some ways with Vygotsky's zone of proximal development and the importance of the teacher in managing in this kind of um, scaffolding that can be um, helpful in adjusting the challenge to the level of skill. For enhanced human resource networks, one can, for example, pair a typically developing older individual with someone with intellectual disabilities. And there are programs that do this. One is called uh, Best Buddies. Another one is the Big Sister, Big Brother program. And I think that there's others as well. And another important strategy for building an enhanced human resource network would be inclusive education at the earliest educational opportunity. Kids need to be included with typically developing kids, both for the role modeling they receive and also for the fact that they are included, that they're not being ostracized, rejected, put off in an institution or somewhere in a special class in a trailer in the back of the schoolyard where they can truly feel like they're as, as uh, deserving of respect and integrity as any individual in the class or in the school. Affirmative career aspirations. One important career aspiration, it's a little bit different here, is the idea of post-secondary education. It used to be thought that people with Down syndrome, for example, could never go on to further education after high school. Well, now there's between two and 300 post-secondary institutions around the country that work with individuals who are diagnosed with intellectual disabilities. The woman in the center, Katie Apostolides, is the first, I believe, the first person diagnosed with Down syndrome to get an AA degree, an associate arts degree, from an accredited institution in Pennsylvania. And she was not given a special honorary degree for having Down syndrome. She worked just as hard as anybody else and was given the degree that everyone else earned as well. And she is a good role model for people with Down syndrome and really shows us the way that we sh should begin to think about 
for each individual with intellectual disabilities the possibility of pursuing further education in a trade it might be or academically as in her case. Careers that might open up based on strengths include caregiving. Remember we talked about prater willi syndrome in particular uh, and the nurturing qualities that they possessed. So working in a nursing home, in a hospital, in a daycare center, in a school could all be good career matches for them. Individuals with intellectual disabilities who have that personal charm and human warmth and interactive ability could well become uh, excellent receptionists in an office. Or they could become entry level data people um, in the uh, information technology world. Positive environmental modifications. The ones that I've chosen are basically wayfinding aids. That is ways of designating how and where various functions in a building or in a classroom are located that don't depend on a lot of verbiage, but rather use color coding in this case, or icons in this case, or again, color coding of elements within a classroom or within an office. Lastly, I'd like you to visualize a setting which illustrates how you'd like to implement positive niche construction for a particular child, teen or adult who's been diagnosed with intellectual disabilities. Just close your eyes and picture what an optimal learning environment looks like for this may be somebody that you know who has intellectual disabilities or just maybe someone that you're just making up in your imagination. Just notice what it looks like, what it feels like, what elements belong to uh, the positive niche construction in this individual's life. Next week in module nine, we're going to explore the bright side of social and emotional disorders. Have a great week and thank you. For further information, get my two books on neurodiversity. First of all, The Power of Neurodiversity, Unleashing the Advantages of Your Differently Wired Brain, and Neurodiversity in the Classroom, Strength-Based Strategies to Help Students with Special Needs Succeed in School and Life.